What's going on, everyone? And welcome to the Dynasty Pros IDP show brought to you by DynastyProsFootball.com and IDPGuys.org. Be sure to check out both websites for latest rankings and trade values. And don't forget to uh, subscribe to us on YouTube. It helps us out a bunch. Um, and without further ado, <clears throat> I'm excited to announce our very first guest for our very first show to my left here is Mr. Gary Davenport, the man, the myth, the legend. Um, let hold on, Gary. Let me uh, let me get catch my breath. Okay, hold on one second. All right, Gary is a three-time Fantasy Sports Writers Association award winner. He works for Football Guys, The Athletic, NBC Sports Edge, Bleacher Report, Fantasy Sharks, and Football Diehards. Gary, did I miss anything there, brother? Uh, I don't think so. Sometimes I lose track of how many places I work for, so I don't know, maybe. <laughs> I, I hear you, man. Gosh, it's, I, you know, uh, as being an IDP guy myself, man, I've got nothing but uh, the utmost respect for you. I love you to pieces, man. I just, I love your work. I look for it every week, and um, I've been doing it for years, and I'm so excited to have you here. Thank you for taking the time. Um, speaking of all those websites you work for, I, I appreciate you fitness fitness in or you you know in between articles here man so thank you yeah it's never a dull moment once the season starts especially early in the season because you know once week one is in the books and week two is all about everyone losing their minds about what happened in week one so gotta oh gotta overreact man to everything <clears throat> for better or worse good or bad everyone is either great or dead yeah yeah like it, it, there's no in between is there no, no, zero, zero. Oh, this guy's great. I'm, oh my gosh, I'm drop. Aiden Hutchinson, I'm dropping that bum. <laughs> exactly, you know. Uh, so, um, you know, speaking of like overreactions, what have you seen? You know, what have you seen anywhere in any of your IDP leagues? Anything that sticks out to you that someone might have just uh, been a little nuts? Any pickups or any ads or anything? You know, the waiver runs really haven't happened <laughs> yet, but I expect to see some panic drops. I see them every year. Even though every intro to every article I write this week is essentially the same thing. Don't freak out. It's okay. I mean, it's great if your guys went out and, you know, racked up 15. They, they, Camus Gruiser Hill went out there and roll, rolled up 16, 17 tackles. That's awesome. It's yeah. fantastic. Get that W to start the season. But if you had a guy who come out and had a down game, it's one week. It's everyone waits all summer long. You know, we wait and we prep for the draft and then we draft our team and then we wait some more. And then finally we get that first weekend of football and people just lose their minds. They, they just come do. completely unglued over. <clears throat> and you got to look at week one, especially now that so many teams don't play their starters in the preseason. It's going to be choppy. It's, it's not necessarily indicative of what we're going to see in the first week of October. It's certainly not indicative of what we're probably going to see in the middle of November. So just, just take a breath. Chill. It's going to be okay. There, there'll be plenty of time to panic in two, three weeks, and then it will be time. If you have a guy who stinks for three, four weeks in a row, then you freak out. Yeah, I, I completely agree. It's like that on the offensive side as well. Some of those. Oh guys. yeah, the Damian Pierce <coughs> hype train went careening off the tracks into a ditch, burst into flames. Oh yeah, and people That's will cool. drop him and pick, and they'll pick up uh, what's his face, uh, Rex Burkhead. <clears throat> they'll pick up Burkhead, so that's kind of funny, I should I'm not gonna bust on Rex Burkhead because I got a couple claims in for him because I had Elijah Mitchell all <clears throat> over the place. So of course he got hurt. Yeah, you know, and so I, I completely get it. You know, there were some guys that I kind of um I picked up and put a little bit of stock into that I I was a little disappointed. And we'll go over some of our biggest surprises from week one and obviously some of our biggest uh disappointments. And uh, what we're planning, you know, what we're planning to do with these guys moving forward. So, um, without further ado, let's uh, let's let's get uh, started on some of the latest NFL news, IDP news, at least. Um, first thing I can think of, one of the big, 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 huge stories, probably the biggest one in IDP, is TJ Watt and his torn pec. Um, I'm super excited that he's not going to miss the season, but uh, looks like he's going to be out for at least about six weeks. What's your thoughts on that? Hey, it, like you said, it could be a lot worse. I mean, when he came off to the sideline and motioned to it and said, I tore my pec, then I, I figured the season was over. So, I mean, hopefully your league has IR spots and you can just stash him there for a month and a half. 
If not, I mean, if you can at all, I have him in one league that's fairly deep and there are no IR spots. I'm holding. I mean, unless I reach a point a month from now where I'm so hard up for a roster spot. And even then, I think I'd rather take a zero than drop one. So you're just going to have to hold and hope that when he does come back, you know, you can get eight weeks of the what you thought. I mean, because he looked phenomenal against this. Was there anything he didn't do against the Bengals? Had a sack, had an interception, had a bunch of tackles, sold nachos at halftime. I mean, <laughs> that's true. Yeah. So <clears throat> it it could have been much worse. So I'm grateful that, you know, I've heard anywhere four weeks, six weeks. I'm planning six. I'm thinking six weeks is probably a reasonably optimistic estimate. Yeah, and I'm and I'm I'm very very happy. You know, I was talking with uh, uh, my co-host over at the Dynasty Pros uh, Fantasy Show, Tommy Harvey. Um, he has him in a league that we have, and, <clears throat> and we were on the phone earlier, and he was just pitching a fit over it. And I told him, I said, it's okay because there's a lot of linebackers out there on the waiver wire that are pretty good contributors. You know, you might go from uh, you might be losing four or five points a week on average over the next six weeks, but it's not like you. You, you can't lose your RB1, you know, you can't lose Jonathan Taylor and go to your waiver wire and find a guy that's going to put up, you know, 15 points per right. game. You know what I'm saying? You know, I, so I told him, I said, listen, it could be a lot worse. Uh, hold on to him, even though I don't think he's hit the IR yet, has he? Has no, he- not to my knowledge. I don't think he has yet. But, you know, some leagues will let you, if a guy's list marked is out, they'll let you IR him. And I would expect they are going to put him on short-term IR just to, why would you hold up the roster spot if you don't need to? It's only four weeks now. So mm-hmm. I, I would figure in the next day or two we'll probably see that happen. Yeah, I was kind of hoping maybe we would have gotten that so I could make a, you know, a waiver claim, but uh, still have that roster spot, especially with, uh, you know, someone like Jamal Adams as well, who who we'll get into here in just a yeah. second here. So yeah, if, if, if you have, if you have TJ Watt, don't freak out. I know it sucks. If anyone has him, you have a pretty big investment in him. This happens. Don't drop him. Just, just hang tight, you know, make some moves other places. Each. I just, I can't imagine a scenario where I'm dropping him in any way. No. If you're in a true position <laughs> league, there should be some guys on the waiver wire that you can plug in that they're not going to be TJ Watt. No, but none of them are. That position is deep enough when you throw in those three, four edge guys and add those to the four, three defensive ends that you should be able to find something to tide you over. And at Absolutely. least you didn't lose them for the year. I mean, it could have been this close to being season over. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and moving on, you know, I, I did mention Jamal Adams just a moment ago. It looks like uh, his knee. I don't know if anything's really come out yet. I know that uh, Pete Carroll was holding it kind of close to the chest there. It wasn't, uh, he just said his knee needed some work. Um, who knows what that really means, but there's a lot of speculation out there that he, he might be done for the season. And that, uh, that kind of stinks because just like TJ Watt, you know, Jamal Adams is probably one of the top two, three safeties that you'd have taken in your drafts or, you know, kept on maybe your dynasty league, uh, team. So, uh, that's another one that stinks. If he does hit the IR sometime shortly, I will be keeping him uh, on my team. If if not, and it's gonna, that's someone that I would maybe consider dropping, depending on the length of time. I expect we're gonna hear at some point once he has through. I think his season's over. To be honest, I don't expect to see just, and maybe I, and I would love to be wrong. Nothing would make me happier, given that, like you say, you hate to lose a DB one <clears> one. <throat> not even half a game, game into the season, but I don't, it did not look good. Cart coming out or no. said that in addition to damage to his knees, got damage to his quadriceps tendon. It, it, just, it sounds like his season is over. And at least it happened in week one to where there are, uh, there's still a plethora. There's probably a pretty good amount of DBs on your waiver wire that oh, you, yeah. can, you can make that, uh, you can make I've, that adjustment. I saw Brandon Jones available in quite a it's still available in quite a few leagues. So if you can go out and replace Jamal Adams with a guy like Brandon Jones, again, it's a hit, but it's not the kind of hit that you can't survive. And if you're gonna get an in if you're gonna have an injury, have it at defensive back because there's always defensive backs on there. I went and grabbed uh, I grabbed Tracy Walker in a few leagues. I mean, that guy will never die. That guy has been great for like a hundred years. Oh, he racked yeah. up everything Sunday, including an ejection. 
<laughs> exactly. Yep. Yep. He might have done a little bit more than uh, T.J. Watt. <laughs> hey, at least he waited. At least he waited until he had a dozen tackles and whatever before he got thrown out of the game, as opposed to doing it three minutes into the first quarter when he didn't have any stats. So, mm -hmm. whatever. Yep. Yep. They um, need to make that a stat in IDP leagues. You need to. I don't know, like four points for a dejection. Sounds really. Reasonable. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Maybe right up there with like a tackle for loss or something, you know, just match it up. <laughs> tackle there. for loss, personal foul, ejection, assault. Gosh, I'm waiting. What what if they, they start doing like a pass interference uh negative one point on a DB or something like that? That'd be so, you know, we've kicked around for years trying to figure a way to make uh cornerbacks more more indicative to where really good cornerbacks score. Instead of, because, you know, in IDP leagues, you don't want a really good cornerback. If they're too good, they won't get thrown at. To, you know, award points based on, like, passer rating against or something. And no one's really been ever been able to come up with a system for it that would work. You know, we've t we've tinkered around with it. And you and I have talked about this. And, you know, we kind of even talked about it at the, uh, at the expo last month. Um, you know, I've been doing IDP leagues for going on almost 15 years now. And... I've tried so many different scoring systems, some that are just not aggressive enough. Like IDPs didn't matter. Um, they were just, they were just there. Um, and then I did some scoring systems that were just a little too aggressive where I think they scored a little too much, but over the years we've really tweaked them in a couple of dynasty leagues that I, that I commission. Um, and I'm pretty happy with the settings we've got. Now the scoring settings we have, and we kind of share that over at dynastyprosfootball.com. A lot of people have given us feedback uh, saying that they use that, that they love it. So uh, we're just happy to contribute there. Um, but it does make corners. I mean, corners are a little bit, um, some of them are, you know, they bring you some value, you know. I mean, uh, our boy out of Indianapolis, um, gosh, Kenny, Kenny, who's Kenny, Moore. Kenny, Kenny Moore. I mean, Kenny Moore is a, is a, is a stud. Oh well, um, yeah, Kenny Moore's a hundred tackle guy. I think he had a hundred. I want to say hundred and three tackles last year. Yeah, he was great. Um, you know, there's some corners. You know, obviously Trayvon Diggs and J.C. Jackson had a lot of good value last year um, because we give you uh, we, we give you about five points per interception. So you know, it's a little bit aggressive, but it makes the corners that much more relevant. You know, of course, you get a point for a pass defended as well. Um, so it does help out help out there. So, uh, you know, I like our, our setting there. It really, really, uh, works out. I think you have a great, great setting over there in the, uh, in the league that I'm in with you with the NBC sports edge league that we do. I really, really like your scoring there. Love it as a matter of fact. So, um, it makes those guys really, really relevant. Um, not a whole lot more. And in, in IDP wise, I mean, Denzel Perryman, who a lot of people have rostered as a kind of a sleeper, you know, kind of a late round, uh, linebacker, uh, it's kind of an ankle issue left the game uh, early the other day and he is questionable this week. Yeah. Um, I haven't, I don't, I don't really know. I haven't been able to really find any information on that. So I'm, I'm kind of taking it as a no news is good news kind of thing. Cause I figure if it was a more serious injury, say a high ankle sprain, something that could cost him multiple weeks that we <laughs> would have heard something by now. So I'm hoping that it's, you know, maybe he'll miss a game or two. But I don't think it's a serious injury again because I, you would think if it's a serious injury, someone. Well, I mean, the Lord knows there's no shortage beat writers covering the Raiders, so I would think one of them would have said something. Uh, agreed. You know, and, and Perriman was a as a was a favorite target of mine late in IDP drafts. Love grabbing him. He was he was very valuable last year. I mean, yeah, he's not he's not a young buck by any means, but um, very very. I mean, very productive. You know, in IDP league. So I hope that he can get back on the field and uh, be healthy very, very soon. So any, uh, any other news that you know of out there that anyone that's, I think relevant that anyone should know about, you know, honestly, we, with the exception of Jamal Adams and TJ Watt, all things considered week one, wasn't that bad injury wise. we got through relatively clean. I mean, certainly cleaner than offense, man. It was brutal on the offensive side. Of the yeah. But yeah, it was. Hopefully we can <clears throat> stay healthy for at least a little while. Although, given my experience. No, we won't. <laughs> well, all right. Well, let's move on to some of our surprises, you know, this week. Uh, there's quite a few of them here. And, um, you know, we'll start, you know, really at some of the most valuable position here, uh, you know, your defensive line edge rusher. Um, who's someone that really stood out to you that surprised you this week? 
Oh, you know, I was happy to see Greg Rousseau do as well as he did, but that didn't really surprise me. Yeah. I mean, Alex Highsmith certainly had a game. Didn't wow. he? Yeah. Three yeah. Seven, High... seven or eight tackle. I mean, great. Game. And that's I a mean, guy who might be on the Y. If you're a guy who lost TJ Watt, go check and see if Alex Highsmith is on your waiver wire. And if so, put in a claim for him right now. Absolutely. Listen to these stats, man. He had nine tackles. Six so six of them were solo, three sacks, two tackles for loss, and a forced fumble. You know, in 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 our scoring system, that was twenty seven point five fantasy points. That is a hell of a game, hell of a game. So very very um, very excited to pick him up. I grabbed him in a couple of leagues today, especially the leagues that I own TJ Watt. I mean, obviously we can't expect a three sack week every week, but. Um, he was someone that I had in a couple of leagues uh, last year that I had on the taxi squad. Um, and so I had to kind of call him up this year. I couldn't keep him on the taxi squad any longer. And um, gosh, I mean, and he sat on my bench. I didn't get to, I, I didn't get to claim any of these points uh, for my week, but buddy, I'm glad that I have him and I didn't have to fight someone for him. Um, Jerry Hughes, old man, Jerry Hughes, yeah. old man, Jerry Hughes with, you know, now with the Houston Texans had, three tackles, two sacks, a forced fumble, an interception, and a pass defended. Scored 22 fantasy points, man. What do you think of that old man Hughes? It's going to be interesting to see because he saw a big uptick in snaps because Mario Addison didn't play. So I think Hughes probably carries a little bit of an exhibition of an expiration date. Excuse me. But uh, yeah, he looked really good. I mean, he turned back the clock a little bit. Jerry Hughes was a guy that once upon a time was quite IDP relevant. And <clears throat> I, I put in a couple claims for him this week in deeper leagues where there's just not much on the waiver wire. It's like I said, it's going to come down to how long those other guys are out because I think once they come back, we'll see Hughes' stat count go down a little bit. But take it on a Denver Broncos team this week that gave up a big game to Nuosu on Monday night. So I wouldn't rule out Hughes. I mean, I don't know. He's not going to go out and put up two sacks every week, but I wouldn't rule out him having a solid game again in week two. You know, speaking of Nuasu, I mean, seven tackles. He had three solo tackles. He had a sack, a forced fumble, and a pass defended. He was the NFC Defensive Player of the Week. He had some key stops, too, uh, some big-time tackles um, in that game and uh, really, really helped his team win. And, and so uh, that's someone that, gosh, I don't know how many people even have him rostered. Uh, you know, he scored about 15 fantasy points for, for a defensive end, for a uh, you know someone that's defensive line eligible. That's substantial. That's big time points, um, depending on your scoring system. So, and you know, and that's something to keep in mind as well. You know, Jerry Hughes. You know, we were talking about him. Depends on what kind of league you play in. Obviously, we've had these discussions, and we won't uh, waste people's time with that. But depending on the kind of league, if if you don't, um, if it's not a true position, if Jerry Hughes is, you know, if linebackers are linebackers and defensive linemen are defensive linemen, and that's it. Um, Jerry Hughes will carry a lot more, um, a lot more value there because of uh, how deep, how thin the defensive line is after the, you know, first four or five elite guys. So, you know, he could certainly help him, but we'll see if he, you know, if he can sustain that once these other guys come back. Um, what about Quiddy Pay? Our oh, boy Quiddy Pay looked really good for the Colts, and there was some talk over the summer that this could be, you know, the, the quote unquote, a breakout year for him because it's second season. And it's not that unusual for first year edge rushers to struggle a little bit, you know, making that jump to the NFL. It's a big gap, but the, even if you played a big time college program, high end draft picks often take a little while to acclimate to the NFL, but there was some talk that he was going to take that next step this year. And he certainly looked like it Sunday against Indianapolis was played every bit as well as DeForest Buckner and played much better than Yannick Ngakwe. That's a line with a lot of talent on it too, which should keep double teams off. Of yeah. Yeah. I mean, he had seven tackles, six of them solo. He had two sacks and two tackles for loss. So that's a hell of a day, man. Um, you know, I'd like to see what, uh, it looks like he's definitely taken that, that next step. And um, I'm really excited to see what he does uh, moving forward. That's some guy that I, you know, especially in dynasty leagues, if for some crazy reason he's on a waiver wire, Oh, you go grab him up because he's got his best years are ahead of him. So what about, uh, <laughs> what about Trayvon Walker? Remember we did a show like a month ago and we're talking Aiden Hutchinson and we're talking 
Jordan Davis. We're talking all these different linemen, but we really didn't talk about Walker. And our man just shut me up. I was, I didn't think, I, I didn't have the highest expectations for him. Um, I thought it was going to take a while for him to be an impact player. And boy, was I wrong. Four tackles, three of them solo. He had a sack, a tackle for loss, and a pass defended. So he had a heck of a game um, in his very first NFL game. Um, Looked like the number one overall pick. Yes, I would did. caution. I would caution people. He's a rookie, so there are going to be ups and downs. There are going to be peaks and valleys. That's just how it goes with rookies. Like I said, even the best rookies have their moments as they acclimate to the end. But yeah, he looked. I'm right there with you. I didn't have the highest. I expected Hutchinson to fit in to kind of make that jump to the NFL better, or at least more quickly than mm-hmm. Trent on Walker. <clears throat> and it's only one week, so I'm it's not. Really good. Hutchinson's not dead or anything. No. But yeah, no. Walker was impressive. And they, you know, Jacksonville needs him to be. They need someone opposite Josh Allen, and they certainly hoped he would be. I mean, you don't spend the number one overall pick on a guy unless you think he can make a dent right away. Yeah, you know, they're feeling a lot better about that because they caught a lot of crap, you know, not taking Aiden Hutchinson. And um, so, you know, they've got to feel a lot better that, that he's um, – that he produced. Um, spe- uh, um, you mentioned Bradley Chubb a little while ago, six tackles, four of them solo, two sacks, two tackles for loss and a forced fumble. What a heck of a day. You know, uh, he's had all the potential in the world. He's had injury issues over the last few seasons. Um, but man, when he's on the field, he produces. And, he did most of that damage in the fourth quarter, too. I mean, he was relatively quiet for the first three quarters of the game. And in that fourth quarter, he just went off. Looked better than Randy Gregory did, at least for that one game. And Chubb is a guy who's going to be on a lot of waiver wires to start this. At least from the leagues that I'm in and looking around, making my waiver claims today, he was available more places than not. So that, that's another guy that you can look to to fill that void left by the T.J. Watt injury. He's not T.J. Watt. But we are talking about a kid who had 12 sacks his rookie year. Now, he's only had, I think, eight and a half the past three years combined, I want to say. Didn't have any last year, and I think he played seven games before he got hurt again. But he he was saying before the season that he's healthier than he's been in years and that he was eager to show that he was 100%, and he was that player that the Broncos spent, uh, I want to say, the fifth overall. It was either the fifth or the sixth overall pick. I can't remember that he was eager to show that he was that guy. And he looked like that guy for the Broncos against the Seahawks. And a nice matchup this week against the Texans. Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe a little bit of a late bloomer, but hey, better late than never. Absolutely. Um, wrap up the defensive line. Tell me a little bit about Rashad Weaver out of the te- out of Tennessee. Uh, he had four tackles, three of them solo. He had two sacks and two tackles for loss. Um, I'm – Kind of, I don't know much about him. You got anything on this guy? Is this for real? I mean, what do we, what can we, you know, expect from this guy moving forward? Talented kid, a little raw. I don't know that we can really expect this sort of thing. I mean, we can't expect this sort of thing every week, but I, I think this game was a little bit of an outlier, if only because he was only on the field for about 48% of the snaps. But he's a guy who's going to see the field more than I think the Titans really wanted him to this year because of the Harold Landry injury. They got to get somebody out there. They got to put somebody out there opposite Bud Dupree. So the kid's going to have opportunities, but given that he's probably going to be a 45, 50% of the snaps type of guy, I think he's going to be kind of up and down. So I think with him, if you have him rostered, that's a guy where you're going to want to target matchups. You don't necessarily – like, I wouldn't roll him out this week against Buffalo. I don't know that you're going to see him make a big dent there. Giants, great matchup. Bills, bad matchup. Move a little farther into the season. If they play, say, Houston, good matchup. So kind of a rotational guy, I think. You don't think that Tennessee is going to – you don't think after the performance he put, he put up on Sunday that – they may try to play him more, especially with that void left by Landry. I, if they do, I think it's going to be gradual because those young kids, I mean, they're, you're going from what a 12 game season to a 17 game season. Mm -hmm. So there's already durability, you know, the rookie wall, 
is a thing. So I don't think they're going to just throw the kid to the wolves and be like, hey, go play 65, 70 snaps every game because it's good. He's going to wear out. So I think he'll still rotate. Maybe as the season wears on, it's kind of like the kid in Chicago that had the big game against San Francisco, whose name is escaping me. Jermaine. Was it? What was he? Uh, uh, Jermaine Robertson, edge rusher. Yes. Yes. Had a sack and a half, I think, against 49ers. Mm-hmm. It's another kid. He's going to be on the field 40, 45% of the time. He got more snaps than Travis. A lot of people were talking up Travis Gibson as a guy you could get late in IDP drafts who was had some sleeper potential, yada, yada, yada. He got more snaps than Gibson did Sunday. So that goes to show you what we know. <laughs> <clears throat> but I, with those young kids, you just – Keep your expectations realistic. You can't – one big week does not mean that they're going to be even a DL2 for the entire season. That said, not a bad kid to have on your bench for, like I said, when you've got that favorable matchup or when bye weeks roll around or injuries are – we've already found out injuries are a thing. So you can – depth is a good thing to have, especially on the defensive line and at linebacker. I don't generally worry about rostering a lot of depth at defensive back – I kind of use the waiver wire as my bench in the secondary, but you can't get away with that on the defensive line linebacker. You cut a guy loose, uh, and he if he's got a pulse by week seven, eight, somebody's going to snatch him up. So you oh, yeah. got to set aside some roster spots for some bench guys at those positions. And both those youngsters are guys that I think are worth rostering, especially if you're in a little bit deeper league. Nice, nice. Um, so yeah, that kind of wraps up, you know, our defensive line, our edge rushers there. I want to talk about a few linebackers and one guy that I was super excited to go and grab today. And that was Pete Warner. Give me your thoughts on him. 13 tackles, 12 of them solo. I know, I know you wrote about him over at, uh, at fantasy sharks. Um, I definitely checked that out and I was, uh, I mean, I took your advice. I was super excited to go grab him and I got him in a couple of leagues, actually two or three leagues, I believe. So, uh, you know, is this for real? Can we expect this moving forward? Uh, maybe not 14 tackles a week. I certainly think he's rosterable. I think it's possible that he'll be an LB3 for the season. I don't know that he's going to be necessarily a top 20, top 25 guy because I think the Falcons ran the ball a lot more than I think anybody expected to. Mariota had a bunch of carries. Corderell Patterson had 22 carries, which – I mean, it's great if you got Patterson on your – because everyone was throwing dirt on Cordero Patterson. Last year was a fluke. Tyler Algier is going to get the ball, or Damian Williams' corpse is going to get the ball. No, Cordero Patterson got the ball. So it meant a lot of tackle opportunities for worse. Second-year kid, I've, I've seen a ton of him because I live in Columbus, so I watch Ohio State every – you have to watch Ohio State every week in Columbus or they'll deport you to Michigan. <laughs> So uh, the talent is certainly there. It's going to be interesting to see when they play teams like this week, they've got Tampa in new Orleans. When they play teams that throw the ball more, that try to spread you out, is he still going to stay on the field or are they going to go with Demario Davis and play more dime? If Werner comes off the field, then there are going to be matchups where I think you're only going to see him play 65, 70% of the snaps and their, you know, odds are his production is not going to be as great, but if he's out there 85, 90%, I think it was about 85% against Atlanta. <clears throat> if he's out there like that every week, then yes, you should abs- he should absolutely be rostered. Great, great stuff. I, I completely agree with you. This one's not really a surprise to me, but I do want to give a quick shout out to Devin White for uh I want to welcome him back and welcome him back to like IDP relevance. Um, he had a great, great game, scored over 22 fantasy points. He had eight tackles, seven of them solo, and he also had a couple of sacks. He could have a big year because, you know, uh, Bruce Arians isn't in Tampa anymore Tell Todd Bowles not to A-gap blitz, and there is not a defensive coordinator on the planet Earth that loves A-gap blitzes more than Todd Bowles does. I mean, if it was up to Todd Bowles, I think he'd just A-gap blitz every play. So I, you're going to see Devin White rush the passer a lot this season. I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to adjust. I'm going to have to make some adjustments to my IDP rankings because, obviously, uh, you know Devin White was taken very, very high last year. I mean, he was considered maybe the number one overall linebacker. You know, in fantasy, he's going to be a little big play reliant. 
I mean, he yeah. just is. He's not a guy that's going to go out and put up 140 tackles. That's just not how the Buccaneers use him. So he's going to need, you know, that six, seven, eight sacks if he's going to finish as a top five, top ten guy. Mm-hmm. You know, already two sacks of the way there. I That game, there were a couple surprises in that game. I got a little egg on my face because I was telling people that you might want to steer clear of Michael Parsons because, you know, Tom Brady doesn't give up sacks. The Buccaneers allowed the fewest sacks in the NFL last year. So, of course, Mike Parsons went out there and said, I don't give a damn about your numbers and yep. sack Brady twice. Yeah. What are you going to do? Yep. Yeah. What do you, what, what, I mean, that's why they play the games, I suppose. So, absolutely. Anyways, I, talking about our boy, uh, Gruder Hill out of Houston, 18 My boy tackles. Camus. Camus. Our boy Camus had 18 tackles, 14 of them solo. He had a tackle for loss. Huge, huge game. Obviously, we can't expect 18 tackles a week, but with the way that offense is kind of lacking, that defense is going to be on the field an awful lot. Um, that is someone that he's been he's rostered. I had I grabbed him in a couple yeah. of leagues in the draft. So he's not sitting out on every waiver wire, but by golly, if he is, he snatch his ass up immediately. Oh, yeah. I was higher on him in the summer than a lot of IDP analysts because I think some people discounted what he did last year a little bit. Thought yeah. maybe that was a little bit of an aberration, kind of born of injuries that the Texans had to their other linebackers. But I liked what I saw from him last year, and I think that week one was just a continuation of it. Like you said, he's not going to get 18 tackles every week. The Colts, how many carries did Jonathan Taylor have in that game? 31, I think it was. Yeah, they were supposed to <laughs> – ease his uh workload right yeah so i mean when you're when you're running back carrying ball 30 plus times that generally means good things for the opposing linebackers but you also have to take into consideration in addition to they're gonna have one more meeting with the colts and jonathan taylor the texans also play the tennessee titans twice and derrick henry has been known to get the ball fairly often so yes absolutely if gruiser hill is out there which uh, he's not in any league i'm in because if he was he'd be sitting on my roster Oh, yeah. yeah, you could. I might even take him over Werner if he were available because I don't think you have to worry about Gruiser Hill coming off the field. It's close, but I would probably lean Gruiser Hill. I kind of think, you know, some of those analysts out there that they were discounting him this year because of like Jonathan Green, Greenard or whatever last year for Houston, you know, kind of putting up some sacks and, you know, they didn't think that was sustainable. I, you know, some people I kind of talked to, um, I guess they just kind of put the two, you know, act like they were two of the same and like, Hey, the, the, it, things are going to be different next year. They're not going to well, be. Well, and to... Chris Kirksey's healthy for now. You yeah. have to, anytime you mention Chris Kirksey, you have to say he's healthy for now, but yeah, I, I it was a great game. And yeah, it, that, it, like it, you said, that Texas defense is probably going to spend a fair amount of time on the field. And you look at who they're playing this week, the Denver Broncos. Denver was running the ball quite a bit against Seattle with Melvin Gordon and Javante Williams, and I would expect that to continue. What I would hope does not continue is trying a 64-yard field goal when you got 45 seconds left on the clock and you just stand there with your thumb in your butt and run all the time off the clock and then because you're on the left hash and try a – oh, my God. It's been a while since I saw coaching – and it wasn't, it's not just Nathaniel Hackett's fault either because Denver had like 12 penalties in that game. And it was the first time since 1987 that a team has fumbled twice at the one yard line. So, I mean, Denver tried really hard to lose that game and they were successful. They were very successful. They did a great job of losing that game. They did. Your maximum effort. Great. Yep. Yep. And speaking of that game, you know, on the other side of the ball, Seattle, uh, you know, Cody Barton. What a great game. Is he filling in for our boy uh, Bobby Wagner? I mean, he had 10 tackles, eight solo, two tackles for loss and a sack, put up 19 fantasy points. You know, what's your thoughts there? Is that something uh, we can think uh, Think he's going to be a solid IDP play for the year? You know, we saw Jordan Brooks and Bobby Wagner put up massive numbers last year. Mm-hmm. And I was, I'll was i admit I was a little hesitant about Barton this summer because I didn't know that you could just say, okay, now Brooks and Barton are going to do what Wagner and Brooks did. Week one, at least, they did. Now, will that continue as the season moves on? I don't know. But for one week, at least, I know Mike Woller was – Mike Woller probably watched that game in Cody Barton underoos. But he had <laughs> he had to be happy about what he saw on Monday night. So it looks like 
that Seattle, the, the, those Seattle linebackers are once again just going to pile up numbers this year. Yeah, I'm I'm excited. I grabbed him in a couple of leagues as well. I mean, there were some disappointments I had at linebacker and some guys I took. <laughs> I, a, I took. A I drafted on. him in the IDP only championship at the universe just because I knew Waller wanted him, so I sniped him just to, mm. just for no other reason than to make Mike angry. That's the only reason wow. I did it because well, that's the kind of person I am. Yeah, I'm well, you know, guy. maybe maybe you know, I don't know if he's watching or not, but maybe we get a comment here in a minute from him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh, I'm, you know, I'm sure Mike has more than a few comments where I'm concerned. Although I don't know if you can say any of them on the air. Yeah, no, I hear that. Um, listen, let's move on to defensive back. There was a lot, you know, we talked about Tracy Walker a little while ago, 13 tackles. He had nine solo. The man had a sack, a tackle for loss, a, a pass defended. You know, he was ejected. He did it all over 18 fantasy points. So that was a great game. Uh, sitting on a lot of waiver wires. I, I snatched him right up, man. The guy's just, he's not sexy, but he's always, he always puts up solid numbers. Last year, he was kind of off and on the field um, with some injuries, some nagging injuries. Um, but when he's on the field, he produces. And so if he's on your, on your waiver wire, that's a guy I'm really, really targeting to go grab him um, because he's proven it for years that, uh, you know, he's not a fluke. He's not a flash in the pan. He's a solid, solid IDP play week in and week out. So. Guys like Tracy Walker, why I wait to draft defensive backs? Because I can get guys like that late every draft. So why absolutely. Am, what am I? Why am I going to spend retail on one of those top five guys when I can get a guy like Tracy Walker in the last few rounds? You're absolutely correct. If you if you're a Jamal Adams owner, that is a great great target. And in hell, to be honest with you, he might out he might have outscored Jamal Adams this year. To be Adams is another guy that's big play reliant. He needs. Mm -hmm. We saw last year he didn't have a single sack after setting the defensive back record for sacks the year before, and his production suffered greatly because of it. He needs those big plays. He's not going to get. He's another one of these. He's not going to go out and pile up 120 tackles. He might not crack 100 if helped. Well, our guy out of San Francisco, I mean, he was a big target of mine on the waiver wire today. Um, uh, Telona, uh, Tela Noah. Tela Noah Hufunga. Hufunga, Huff, Huff. They call him Huff. 11 tackles, nine of them solo, an interception, two tackles for loss, and a pass depended or a pass defended. Um, hell of a game for him. Obviously, it was a nasty, ugly, stinky, wet game. Um, what do we? What can we expect? I know he's a huge waiver wire ad this week. What can we expect out of him, or what do you expect moving forward with this guy? And I'm asking for me. I'm really, you know, I want to know because I have grabbed him in a couple of leagues. I don't know that we're going to see what we saw Sunday. Every week. I do think that he has, say, DB two potential. I talked him up over the summer as a guy you could get super late. That I liked what I saw from him last year when he was able to get on the field when he started. I think I want to say two games last. year. And he was going to step into that box safety role for the 49ers this year. I think a lot of people expected when they signed George Odom from Indianapolis that Odom was going to be the guy. It became clear by the first week, first, second week of camp that it was going to be Hufanga. And he looked fantastic. Coaching staff was talking him up after that game. Broadcasters were talking him up after that game. Teammates seemed to love him. If there's a downside with him, the linebackers in front of him are really good. So mm -hmm. tackle opportunities could be a little hit and miss with him because of Fred Warner and Dre Greenlaw and Aziz Alshair. But if he's on the waiver wire, absolutely go get him. Certainly a guy that you want to stash on the bench. That if, I wouldn't mind having him as, say, a third defensive back. Assuming you start two, I'm mm -hmm. probably not going to roster more than three. And having Hufanga as that third guy, yeah, that works. Absolutely. Oh, gosh, heck of a pickup, yeah, especially if you have him as, like, your DB3, which a lot of people probably will. I mean, no, rare, I mean, it was, you know, very few people drafted him, in my opinion. So, uh, a great, I mean, what I, am I? I had to start him in a deep IDP league because Cam Curl got hurt. I don't have a ton of depth and safety. Had to put him out there. So, when I looked at the stat line after the game, I was like, looked at my score. Sure enough, my team won. I'm not saying Hufanga was solely responsible for that. But I appreciate your help. Yeah, he uh, sure as hell didn't hurt it. Uh, no, no, that he did not. Absolutely not. Um, let's see, man. Marcus Williams. Marcus Williams out of Baltimore had a heck of a game. He had 12 tackles in that game, 10 of them solo. He had an interception, a pass, 
defended. I mean, he scored 17 fantasy points. I mean, obviously, we can't expect that week in and week out, but a hell of a debut for the Ravens. Picked up right where he left off last year. Um, I'm super excited being a Baltimore fan of this guy, but what do you expect? I mean, is he someone that should be picked up, rostered, and maybe, I mean, slide him into your lineup each week, or is he? do you find him more of a big play-dependent type of guy? I think he might be a little more of a deeper league guy, if only because he's – Going to play more deep safety than box safety, I would expect. They're going to have Chuck Hart probably play more box safety. And I wonder, as we move into the season, are they going to try to get Kyle Hamilton on the field? That said, I had a great game. And if you're in a deeper league and the waiver wire is looking a little sparse and Marcus Williams is there, I would totally pick him up. So they, got, they got Miami this week. Eh, not a great matchup. Not a terrible one either. So I would probably, I'm guessing in my rankings, he's probably a DB3 this week. I'd say 30-ish, probably. Hmm. You know, Miami might be a sneaky, decent matchup for him because they're they're wanting to throw the ball. And um, that's, uh, you know, I don't know if he's going to be playing center field. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure that he's going to probably be looking at, you know, Tyreek and uh, watching Waddle, making sure none of those guys get behind him. So, um I'm really interested in seeing how he uh, how he answers his his fantasy week this uh, this Sunday. So very much looking forward to that. Um, another guy for the Baltimore Ravens, as a matter of fact, you know, Marlon Humphrey had seven tackles and scored uh, double digit fantasy points. Um, another big play corner, and I know we don't talk about corners because they're not the most relevant, but I will say Marlon was a guy that I did target um, picked up for virtually for free. Um, no one was drafting him because, you know, a couple of years ago, Marlon was a stud punching the ball out, uh, you know, causing turnovers, um, racking up tackles, passes defended. He was a sneaky, good, you know, defensive back, not just a cornerback. He was one of the top cornerbacks, but a great defensive back and almost a weekly start. Um, this year, getting Marcus Peters back and having Marcus Williams and Kyle Hamilton and Chuck Clark still playing there. I think that they will kind of – they may target him a little bit. I think that the opposing teams, once Marcus Peters gets back out there, he's going to be a – they're going to try and test him. Um, however, I think that, you know, Marlon's going to be – you know, if you're in a league that plays corners, I think Marlon is definitely a guy to go grab. Um, oh, think, totally. Yeah, a solid, solid IDP play, especially if you have to start corners. But even if your uh, waiver wire's thin, if these guys are snatching up all the DBs, um, you know, he's a guy that just in case he's not sitting there um, or if he is sitting there, go grab him up. I mean, I love what I've seen. And I think I can expect sort of the same from him almost week in and week out. And he didn't even do what he does best with causing fumbles and punching the ball out, things like that. That's just the icing on top. Um, I really think he's going to have a great, great year defensively. And I think it's going to translate in fantasy points. So I had him third or fourth, I think, among quarterbacks headed into the season. Like you said, he's got an affinity for making big plays. He's a decent mm -hmm. tackler. And I think he'll get thrown at. And, you know, going up against Miami this week, got Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle. So those corners might be a little busy. Yeah, I, I completely <clears throat> agree with you there. Um, our boy out of Vegas, Nate Hobbs, nine tackles. He had six solo, you know, two tackles for loss, a forced fumble, a pass defended. Um, I think what is he a corner? I believe out yeah, of his corner. Yeah, he is a corner. It's what I thought. So he's a he's the kind of IDP corner that I usually wind up with a lot of shares of because I get him in the last round or pick him up off the waiver wire after the season start. He's good enough to keep his job, but not good enough that opposing quarterbacks are at all afraid to throw at him. And you know, every time that receiver catches the ball in front of Nate Hobbs, that gives Nate Hobbs an opportunity to tackle the guy, and hmm. then you get stats. That's like I said, you don't want a corner that's too good. Honestly, sometimes you, you want those guys that get tar uh, Obviously, Trayvon Diggs was a high scoring corner because he had 11 interceptions, but it didn't hurt that he got targeted a ton because teams, even though he picked off 11 passes, no one is afraid to throw at Trayvon Diggs. So he gets those tackle opportunities too. 
Well, he gave up some. I mean, he had those those eleven picks last year, but Trayvon. I mean, I mean, Diggs gave up some big plays too. Oh yeah, he yeah. gave up more yardage and coverage than any quarterback in the NFL. He gave up over a thousand yards. There you go, and that's the reason why they threw at him. Man, he was uh, feast or famine. Uh, luckily, you know, you don't get uh, you don't get penalized for all the yards you give up. But buddy, uh, you you definitely got a lot of points for those uh, for those picks. That was a hell of a year. Do you think Nate Hobbs is a guy you should? you should roster. I mean, is this someone maybe we should just sit back and maybe see if he continues this over the next couple of weeks? And, um, or is this someone that you think you want to get ahead of the curve and maybe go ahead? And especially if you have a, a little bit, a bit deeper, I mean, most IDP leagues have pretty deep benches because you have IDPs. Um, so is this someone that you would roster or, you know, what's your thoughts? I've got a couple claims in for him this week in leagues that require cornerbacks. Cause I think this week's matchup with Arizona is decent. And in most CB required IDP leagues, I stream my corners. I'll pick up a guy that's got a decent matchup, roll him out there, and then kick him to the waiver wire and grab somebody else. And I think Hobbs is a decent play this week. I mean, I'm not going to burn like a high waiver priority or anything for him. No. And I don't know that you even need to put in a waiver claim. You can probably wait until after waivers run and go in with first come, first served and get him that way. So that you're not, if it's a rolling waiver priority, that way you're not burning your spot to pick him up but yeah you know those anonymous cornerbacks it's <laughs> entirely possible that that will be the best game he's had all year also possible that he'll go out this week because he's probably going to be on marquise brown and get you know half a dozen tackles again which that's all i ask from a cornerback if you go out there and get me five or six tackles and maybe a pass defense or two good enough i'm fine i mean Absolutely. an interception is outstanding but i'm not expecting those. those are icing I just want a little cake, and then if you want to put icing on it, that's fine. There you go. You're absolutely right. You, 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 I wouldn't have said it any better myself. So, you know, that's some guys. What about our boy uh, Derek Forrest out of Washington? He had five tackles, four of them solo. He had a pick. He had a forced fumble and two passes defended. So he had a heck of a little uh, nice little day, kind of a younger guy. Um, you know, is it someone that maybe we should just leave on the wire or, um, you know? All depends on whether Cameron Curl's going to be healthy enough to play this week because that's yeah. who he played in. He subbed in for Cam Curl. From what Ron Rivera was saying last week, it sounded like he was reasonably optimistic that Curl was only going to miss the one game after he had surgery on his thumb. Now, maybe Washington will look at how well he played and say, okay, we don't have to rush Curl back and he'll get one more week. But he's a guy, you know, maybe you're going to get one game. I don't think it's going to be any more than that. And then once Curl's back, throw him back to the waiver wire. So if, if you're in a deeper league, you need a DB starter, and we get later in the week, and it looks like Curl's not going to play, go ahead and pick him up. But he's not a guy that I'd be running to the waiver wire because it's just his value it has an expiration date, and it's the date is <laughs> pretty close. So use him when you can, while you can use him. You know, if you can get another game, squeeze another game out of him, then that's that's right. great. Is he the cam curl handcuff? <laughs> yeah. yeah, there you go. We start handcuffing defensive backs. I give up. That's it. That's yeah. That that would be uh, that that'll be the day, my friend. That will be. Well, listen, I think that wraps it up as far as our our you know guys that really surprised us this week. You know, and. Uh, I want to move on before we uh, before we end the show, and you know, let's uh, let's talk some people off the ledge here because there were some disappointments, um, you know. And I'm going to start, you know, our guy. You and I both love him, um, Aiden Hutchinson. Uh, he had like I think a half of a tackle. He didn't even score one fantasy point. Um, how are you feeling after week one? You know, th this is what we talked about in the beginning of the show. Let's not freak out. Um, better days are ahead. Don't drop him. Don't, don't do anything crazy like that. I mean, what's your thoughts on Aiden? It was his first NFL game. I mean, sure, it'd be great if he went out there and had two and a half sacks, but it's much more likely that he wasn't going to get one. I'm sure you'd like to see something. But especially with defensive linemen, you just have to live with the fact that those guys are occasionally going to go out there and put up half a point, a point, nothing at all. Even the very Miles Garrett, Chandler Jones, guys like that will go out and throw up a donut. So I don't know. I don't think I started Hutchinson anywhere. I've got him rostered in a few spots, but he was sitting on my bench. 
if you did start him, maybe you want to look at a depth option, you know, a guy that maybe you can roll out there for a few weeks until Hutchinson kind of gets his legs underneath him. But no, I'm not panicking. I He could go out there and do the same thing in week two, and I'm still not going to panic. I don't, if you expected anything more than, say, eight sacks out of Hutchinson, I think you were being unrealistic. Usually with rookies, I figure if you can get seven, eight sacks, that's a decent year for a rookie. They're not – sure, there are guys who will go out and get 10, 12 sacks as a rookie, but that's much more exception than rule. You know, I don't own any Aiden Hutchinson. I don't have him a single place. And I think the reason why is because all that – the drafts that I had that, you know, obviously with IDPs, I had people took him in the first round. I mean, every draft that I was in – he went in the first round, and I mean, he would go. I mean, people were taking him in front of like Garrett Wilson and Jamison Williams, and you know some of these decent. I mean, I saw him go in front of like James Cook and and Ken, you know even Kenneth Walker in one league. Um, it, it's pretty wild. So that's the reason why I just uh, I don't own a single share of his. I don't have a single share of Trayvon Walker because those guys went entirely way too high i mean i would have dropped a second round pick on them um depending on who was available on offense but the the guys that you know people got just horny over these guys and grabbed them in the first round which to me was just absolutely nuts only rookie idps i have ever drafted in the first round of a rookie draft have been if i was sitting at the end of the round and i had a big hole at linebacker and then Mm -hmm. maybe i'd add the top linebacker in the class but yeah very rarely would I consider dropping a first round pick on a rook. No, first round for offensive guys. It's too I easy made a, to find defense. I made a trade. Um, I was I'll never <laughs> I was like driving around and 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 our rookie slow draft was going. Uh, and this has been a couple of years ago. And um gosh, I was trying to take a linebacker, and I cannot remember who it was for the life of me. Um I don't, I don't think it was Devin Bush. I mean, mate, I mean, or Devin White. I don't think it was Devin White. Maybe actually, I think it was Devin White. I think I was really trying to grab <coughs> him. And correct me if I'm wrong, because I, I could be mixed up. But I remember I was working out a deal with a guy, and I was trying to get. It was like the tenth pick in the in the first round, and all the great offensive players had gone. And I was like, oh, I want to get this guy. I want to get this linebacker. I want to get him. Going to get him. I was trying to make a deal with this guy. And um, I wouldn't tell him who I wanted to take and I could not make a deal with him. So I made a deal with the guy that had the like 11th pick and I thought, okay, well, if, if, if Devin doesn't get taken here, I'm going to take him at 11. And of course the guy with the 10th pick that I was trying to get (laughs) took him and please correct me if I'm wrong. I think it was the same draft because with the 11th pick I settled and I took a guy named Nick Bosa. So (laughs) I think I was, uh, I was pretty – is that not the same draft? It might have been. I can't remember, but I knew I wanted to grab some linebacker. I could have swore it was Devin White. Um, maybe I'm on crack or something. Maybe I'm nuts, but um, I took Nick Bosa um, instead and um, very, very glad that I did. Um, as a matter of fact, I don't even think it was Devin White that I wanted to take. I think it was Devin Bush. For Pittsburgh. Well, he dodged the bullet there. Yeah, and as a matter of fact, I really do think that I wanted to grab Devin Bush out of Pittsburgh. That's who it was. And well, he was the first off-ball linebacker drafted that year. That was the last time that – because, you know, the Steelers never trade up to pick a yeah. guy. That They did that year. That I remember shot. I was at that draft. That was the draft that was held in Nashville uh, right down the road from us. We went to that <clears> draft. <throat> I was out in the street going crazy when they made that trade, because I was kind of hoping he would fall back and my Ravens maybe snatch him up. But uh, when Pittsburgh Devin White up, was drafted that year, though. OK, so I was right. It was Devin Bush, though. I, I wasn't as cool they, to grab Devin White. Devin White ended up being the, the stud. But uh, Devin right. Bush, I think, was the guy that I wanted to get. And, uh, you know, my all three of went. The, all three went in the top ten. Nick Bosa mm-hmm. went second overall. White went fifth overall. And Devin Bush went tenth overall. Yeah, I just remembered I was a little disappointed. I was like, ah, I got this 11th pick. There's nobody up. You know what? I'll take freaking Bosa. I'll take oh, Bosa. Yeah. He's okay. Yeah, right. I'll just take him. But I didn't have, like you were saying with rookies, I didn't have very, very high expectations out of him 
whatsoever as far as his rookie year. I thought it was going to take a couple of years. Um, but I see the same kind of – I have the same mentality when it comes to Aiden Hutchinson there. So Yeah, just be patient. It'll be fine. Absolutely. He's good. Yeah. And and you kind of brought up Chandler Jones. Chandler Jones had a lackluster game. You know, he only scored like five fantasy points. He only had a couple of tackles and a one. Of, you know, he had a tackle for loss, which is okay. But obviously, some of those defensive ends. You know, I like Chandler Jones a lot this year because a lot of leagues that that only play defensive linemen or linebackers. It can't be both or or dual eligibility, whatever. I mean, Chandler Jones is not a linebacker. He is a defensive lineman this year. Um, so that holds a lot more value in, in a lot of leagues, but, um, I had him started in a couple and, uh, I was, I'll be I'll be I was pretty disappointed in him. Um, but that, Hopefully that he'll be motivated to play his old team this weekend. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe this will be like, what was it last year? You know, he played the Titans and he had like five sacks in that game. Week, week one. one. Holy yeah. Shit. But then after week one, I think three out of the next four games after that, he donutted. Zero. He did. He Not did. A thing. I remember a guy dropping crazy fab on him uh, after week one last year. And then like by week five, he had dropped him. <laughs> you know, I was like, wow, wow. That well, was just... Jones only had, I think, five and a half more sacks after. I mean, 10 and a half for the year. You look at it and you say, oh, well, 10 and a half sacks is a good year. He had five of them in week one. Mm-hmm. He yeah he didn't really do anything that middle part of the season and then towards the end, uh you know he put together some decent points. But yeah yeah if you picked him up uh after week one and you were expecting you know big performances, man you were you were pretty pissed off uh for a good month month and a half with him. Um, you know another defensive lineman that disappointed me a little bit that I kind of have higher hopes that I thought would have taken another step forward this year was Marcus Davenport. Um, only had a couple of tackles you know, really. And that was it, you know, nothing else, no tackles for loss, no, no, uh, nothing. I mean, it really even pressured the quarterback very much. So um, a guy that I have, you know, fairly high in my rankings um, really, really put up just kind of a shit show on, you know, so. It's all right. It'll be all right. Now I don't necessarily expect that to change this week. Cause again, they're going up against Tampa and, the Buccaneers were dead last in the NFL in sacks allowed last year. Thank you. You just did it. You just did it. <laughs> now he goes complete Micah Parsons for us. <laughs> See, there you go. You're welcome. <laughs> but I I still think Davenport, by the time the dust settles, is probably going to be in DL2 territory. You know, 18 to 20 range is probably where I'd have him. Had a good year last year. Last year he finally started to look like the guy that the Saints gave up an extra first-round pick to get. And it's understandable that it took him a little while to kind of get his legs under him. You know, there's a bit of a jump in competition from Texas, San Antonio to the NFL. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I just, uh, the thing that I had a hard time with is there were a lot of IDP studs this past week and I didn't want to go too crazy, but man, I really looked at some guys I wanted to grab off the defensive line. um, And man, I really considered really consider dropping Davenport. I mean, I was looking at that and thinking maybe do I cut bait here and grab some of these other guys? Um, and it really, really, uh, you know, quit like quitty pay, you know, uh, Bradley Chubb, depending on, you know, I wouldn't drop him for like Jerry Hughes or anything like that, but you know, Trayvon Walker, if he was available out there in like redraft type of leagues or something. I mean, I really, really consider dropping Marcus Davenport. I, I'm kind of higher on him than a lot of people are. And uh, so it really would hurt my soul to drop him, especially this early. I just don't want to overreact. Pay and Davenport are pretty close to my rank. We're pretty close to my rankings entering the season. Yeah, I and like I said, I don't know that I expect a big game this week, but You give him until week three, maybe. I don't know. The problem is if you wait, Pay's probably going to get snatched up. So I wouldn't – I'm not going to advise you to drop Davenport, but I wouldn't necessarily – if you could get Quiddy Pay for him, I'm not necessarily going to look at you sideways like you did something wrong either. Yeah. I don't That's think Quiddy Pay makes it this week. You know, a lot of waivers ran today, and some some leagues waivers run tomorrow. I can't imagine in an IDP league where Quiddy Pay is going to be sitting out there, you know, after waivers have run. No, you'd hope not. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you're playing against uh, decent people. So um, let's move on to linebackers and, and, and DBs before we close everything up for the evening. Um, 
you know, we talked about San Francisco. We were talking about, you know, Huff and everything. But Fred Warner, yeah, he had four solo tackles, six total tackles. Didn't score very many points, like five points. That was a bit of a disappointment because that's a guy that that a lot of people drafted very, very highly, you know, as a as a top tier type of linebacker, you know, really, really looking for those sack or not sack totals, but tackles. Um, and there just wasn't a whole lot. Do we just chalk it up as a, you know, just a crappy game, rainy game, nasty game? Exactly. Um, OK. You know, yeah, I'm not year. I'm not worried about it at all. I mean, Chicago barely had 200 yards of offense in that game, so they weren't you know, sustaining eight, 10, 12 play drives, you throw in the weather. Yeah, just a fluke. I'm not not concerned at all about Fred Warner. I would expect that he'll rebound at least somewhat this week against Seattle. Although the Seahawks, again, not a great matchup for linebackers. But Warner's not a guy you want to even consider dropping. Unless you're in a league with me, in which case, you know what? Go ahead. Drop him. Yeah, yeah, go right ahead. Yeah, I'll yeah, ahead. yeah. I'll Let take him, him off your hands for you. I'll do you <laughs> that solid. I'm a helper. Yeah. Well, you know, there's a couple of linebackers out there that um, I don't know how to really describe it, um, that people thought they were trying to be a little smarter than others. And one guy that kind of stands out to me is Cole Holcomb. You know, a lot of people are trying to jump on that wagon. Um, obviously I think better days are ahead of, you know, for him, but you know, he only had five tackles, only two of them were solo. I mean, you know, he scored just a few fantasy points. I mean, I don't even think he broke four fantasy points for the week. Um, you know, you were in a lot of IDP leagues, you and I, and a lot of people were kind of, I think what I saw was people, um, drafting this guy a little higher thinking that, you know, like he was a name all off season, um, that, you know, that, you know, was a sneaky good little ad, you know, like get ahead of everyone, you know, grab this guy before he blows up and then you can't get him. Um, what's your thoughts on Holcomb moving forward? I'm not concerned about Jacksonville's run game was, I mean, James Robinson was okay in that game, but they didn't, it's another instance where they didn't really sustain drives very well. If he doesn't bounce back, Pretty significantly this week, I might become a little more concerned. Detroit led the NFL in fantasy points allowed linebackers last year. So I would hope that we'll see a better game out of him. I was fairly high on Holcomb this, this year. I think I had him in my top 15. I don't think I don't know that he was in my top 12. I think he was in that 12 to 15 range. Just not a great matchup in week one. So again, much better matchup in week two. So if he can't go out there and get you, I don't know, eight, ten tackles this week, then maybe that concern level will ratchet up a little bit. I'm hoping maybe Jamin Davis can put up a halfway decent number this week too, because he was he got the snaps this past week. And Davis was out there for I want to say 93 percent of the defensive snaps after not even cracking 70 percent last year. But the number, his tackle efficiency was awful again, and it was not good last year. So I was hoping Davis. He's going to kind of take that step forward in his second season, but we didn't see it in week one. Yeah, a little bit of a disappointment. So, yeah, let's – if you grabbed Cole Holcomb, what we're basically telling you is uh, don't cut bait on him yet. Right. You know, hang on, hang on. You know, guys are going to have, you know, kind of lame games, and he just happened to go ahead and knock it out of the way for you week one. So um, another guy that yeah, was a big disappointment for me was Eric Kendricks. Um, he only had, like – four tackles. He had a pass defended, but there again, just like Holcomb, man, the guy didn't even put up four fantasy points. Um, and, you know, and he was a great, great, you know, IDP guy last year. So yeah, are we, are we kind of feeling the same way about him as we were just talking about Holcomb? Well, given that Jordan Hicks had a really, a big game yes. for the Vikings against yes. Green Bay, I would say there's maybe a little more concern there. I'm not freaking out about Kendrick yet. I already expected that Kendrick was going to come back to earth a little bit this year. Between Hicks being in town and the Vikings defense was on the field a ton last year because it wasn't very good. They couldn't stop anybody, so they were constantly giving up long drives. I figured the defense was going to be a little improved. Hicks is there. And prior to last year, Kendrick had never had 120 tackles in the season. And the last year he topped 140. So I figured we were going to see a little regression. I didn't think we'd see, you know, him slide back this far and Hicks yeah. put up a big number. So, you know, let's see what happens this week against Philadelphia, a team that runs the ball a ton. They weren't a great matchup for linebackers last year. Actually, they were a poor one, which is kind of weird given how much they've run the ball. 
But let's see what that Hicks Kendrick split looks like once they play the Eagles on Monday night. I'm assuming it will level out a little bit more. I don't think we're going to keep seeing Hicks way up here and Kendrick's way down here. So I'm I have a few shares of Kendrick's. I'm going to be starting him again against Philadelphia. If that split continues and we keep seeing Hicks racking up big numbers and Kendrick's kind of mediocre, you know, three or four weeks of that, I'm going to start worrying. But just one, I'm more concerned about Kendrick's than I am about Holcomb or Warner. But I'm not, you know, I'm not hitting any big red panic buttons yet or anything. Yeah, I've gotten a lot of questions. As a matter of fact, one of the most questions I've gotten on Twitter and you know, and some other places in the leagues I'm in is Eric Kendricks because a lot of people did draft him. A lot of people had him in their starting lineup. He wasn't sitting on very many benches. Um, so that that one kind of hurt people, that performance. Some people may not have had Holcomb in their starting lineup, but, you know, people like Fred Warner and Eric Kendricks and, you know, these guys were in your starting lineup for the most part. And so that's what kind of stinks is they they did let us down. But you're saying, you know, listen, Holcomb's going to be okay, but Kendricks, with the addition of Jordan Hicks, um, you know, there is a little bit more concern. A little more wait and see. Among the big-name linebackers, the guy I'm probably most worried about is Isaiah Simmons because he spent a lot of time in the slot against Kansas City. And if that continues week after week after week, his tackle numbers, he's not going to put up linebacker tackle numbers playing the slot. It's just not going to happen. So if that continues over the next couple weeks, then he's unrosterable. Yeah, I mean, right. He, depending on what's out there on your waiver wire, you may be making a tough decision. Where I say, and you know, this whole star linebacker role or whatever the Cardinals want to call it, it might be the best thing for Simmons, given his skill set, and a way for the Cardinals to maximize what Isaiah Simmons does well. But that doesn't necessarily translate to IDP leagues, and right now, it's not. It just is. Yeah, Simmons is definitely a guy that um, if I owned him, I would be maybe if, if that continues to where he's playing this role, um, I can't cut him, but I would certainly trade him because there's going to be someone, one or two people in your league that is, I would say, at least willing to give up, you know, a third and a fourth or maybe a second round pick, you know, to grab him. If you can get a second, you jump all over it. But I hope um, for a hope for a fluke big game so that you can sell, you know, get a little bit better value. I hope he goes out there and puts up a dozen tackles against Vegas this weekend and then just be done with it. All right. Yeah. I would be at all surprised if Nick Vigil winds up with more fantasy points than Isaiah Simmons and that, you know, Vigil's a guy that you've been pretty high on, you know, and, I'm, and Nick Vigil won't die is the problem. He just keeps coming back. Yeah, it's like the he's like Tracy Walker of, of linebackers or something, man. You know, he just I, I'm right there with you. Um, I just, he's going to be playing those. If Isaiah Simmons is in the slot, then it's going to be Vigil and Collins playing those inside linebacker slots. And it's just, it's a better tackle opportunity for Vigil than it would be for Simmons. Collins had a decent stat line in week one. That was at least somewhat encouraging. It'll be mm-hmm. interesting to see if he can build on that this week against the Raiders. Cause I mean, Kansas City's not a good linebacker matchup. So to be able to put up a decent stat line against the Chiefs is, not, it's not bad. Um, let's move on to DB, man. Xavier McKinney for the Giants, you know, uh, you know, he only put up a few fantasy points. Um, this is someone that, you know, some folks really, really picked him up and, you know, I had him in a couple of leagues. Luckily I wasn't starting him. Thank goodness. Um, but you know, I've been a pretty solid IDP play and, um, you know, what do you expect from him moving forward? I think he'll be fine. Tennessee just couldn't really generate any offense in that game. I mean, it was an ugly game, so mm-hmm. I would, I'm guessing he'll the things will be better starting this week against Carolina. It sounds weird to say Carolina looked better on offense in week one than Tennessee, but they did. So I think he'll be fine. I had I said by the time we got to week one, I thought maybe McKinney could crack the top five this year because the linebackers in front of him, Tay Crowder and Austin Calitro, are not good. Yeah, with the you know, take away Blake Martinez now. Right. You know, but, he, and he, uh, and Week one didn't necessarily bear that out, but again, it's just one week. So no, I'm not my concern level on a scale of one to ten with Xavier McKinney is a one. I'm not oh, okay, that. great, great. So yeah, don't freak out if you're a McKinney owner. Okay, that makes me feel a little bit better. You know, before we close things out, man, the 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 Cincinnati safeties, man, Von Bell, Jesse Bates did absolute jack squat. Um, and I know Jesse Bates is someone that 
if I'm not mistaken, someone you've liked, you know? Yeah, um, I'm don't worry about it. Pitt, did you see Pittsburgh's offense on Sunday? It was the <laughs> they, it was, it was awful. They sucked. And Najee Harris, I think, had like 12 touches for 26 yards. Their offensive line is hot garbage. Mitchell Trubisky is not the kind of quarterback that's going to carry a team. So I, I'm not worried about Bates or Bell. That was just a bad matchup. Problem is, this week, now they get another bad matchup because it looked like it was going to be a really good matchup. You were going to be facing a Dallas Cowboys team that led the NFL in points and yards per game last year. But now you're not facing Dak Prescott. You're facing Cooper Rush. So I don't know. You know, I wouldn't be that surprised to see another slow week from Cincinnati this week. But they're not, you know, they're not going to play dumpster fire offenses every week. So I'm unless you unless there's some serious meat on your waiver wire, you can get a high end guy, which most leagues I play and you're not going to be able to do that. Then just hold on Bates and Belt. They'll be okay. It's going to be well, you know, they've got the, they've got a kind of a crummy ma- matchup this week, like you say. But you know, keep in mind they still have to play Baltimore twice. They still have to play Cleveland twice, which love absolutely love to run the ball. Does that po- I mean, does that not create yeah, a little I mean, bit of concern? Things are going to get better for Bates and Bell. It's just Pittsburgh was terrible. I don't know how many uh, defensive snaps the Bengals played, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was less than sixty. Might not. I think it was probably 50. My guess would be between 50 and 60. The Bengals had the ball most of that game. Yeah. And then Baker Fitzpatrick had a – which he had a pick six, which that helps. But he had a big tackle day too because they were on the field all day. It's mm-hmm. one of those things, you know, your IDPs can't generate stats if they're not on the field. So if you've got a – if they're playing a crappy offense that can't stay out there, it's not good. You're not getting the opportunities. You're not getting the snaps. You're not getting the snaps and the opportunities – then you're going to need a big play to do it. And it just wasn't there. They'll be yeah. fine. Well, cool. Cool. Well, listen, that's about all that I've got, you know, as far as, uh, you know, this week one behind us and, you know, with some of our surprises and disappointments and all that good stuff, uh, moving on to week two, um, are there, do you have any guys that you would recommend before we, we close things up? Are there any sleepers? Are there any guys that maybe we didn't talk about, um, that you would maybe pick up off of your waiver wire or some some guys that you think will have a good week this week that's not uh, necessarily on that fantasy radar for most. Okay, we'll go a little deep. These guys should all be available in most leagues. Defensive line, I'll go A.J. Epinesa of the Buffalo Bills. Had Ooh. a sack and a half against the Rams. Okay. In the season opener, which tied his season high. That's the most sacks he's ever had in a year. <laughs> much less than a game. Yeah. Was actually on the field for one more snap than Von Miller was in that game. Was on the field for about 55% of the snaps. Bills but are Von rotating. got all the love. Bills are rotating defensive linemen a lot. I think the Bills are going to have him out there quite a bit against the Tennessee Titans, too, because Epines is a decent edge. That they're going to want him to set that edge against Derrick Henry in the run game. Titans were, I think, second in the league last year in fantasy points allowed to defensive linemen and gave up, I want to say, 47 sacks. So I think Epinesa could be have another sneaky good game Monday night at home against the Titans. Linebacker, I'm going to go Frankie Louvu of the Carolina Panthers, who actually played more snaps in week one than Shaq Thompson did. Louvu was who led the Panthers in snaps among linebackers when, say, it was 85%. Didn't have a great stat line against Cleveland, which is a little upset given that Cleveland runs the ball as much as they, but yeah, I think he had, I want to say six or seven tackles. Not great, not terrible. Going up against the Giants team this week that leaned hard on Saquon Barkley against the Titans in week one. So I think there will be mm-hmm. ample tackle opportunities for Lugu in that matchup. And in the secondary, I'll go with Josh Jones of the Seattle Seahawks. Mm. Former second-round pick of the Green Bay Packers. Mm-hmm. Started, I want to say, eight or nine games his first two years in the league with Pack. Showed some ability to be IDP relevant when he is starting. Will be starting with Jamal Adams out. And I think he had seven tackles against Denver. I want to say it was four solos and three assists. Not terrible for not playing the whole game. Taking on the San Francisco 49ers. You know they're going to run that ball. So Jones will probably spend quite a bit of time in the box. You know, I think I wouldn't be stunned if you get a top 25 defensive back week out of him in week two. And again, all three of those guys, 
are going to be on 90% of waiver wires. So if you're, oh, yeah. if you're looking for a sneaky sleeper, a little bit of a deep play, those guys might be able to help you out. <clears throat> well, man, that's why they call you the Godfather. You're the king of IDP, man. And, uh, you know, I appreciate you taking the time and, you know, spend a good hour or so with us um, out of your busy, busy, hectic day. Um, I, I can't tell you how much I admire you and how much I look up to you. Um, and again, I appreciate you being part of the show today, man, for our first Oh, episode. it was my pleasure, Bob. Thank you so much. And uh, so for everyone watching out there, thanks for watching the show. Be sure to check us out on YouTube and, and hit that subscribe button. It helps us out tremendously. So for myself, Bob Miller, and for Gary Davenport over there, we appreciate you watching. Thank you. You all have a good night. We'll see you next week.